Here's an old Boy Scout handbook I have lying around, and I've opened it here to the section on trees. As Boy Scouts, we were taught to recognize trees by their morphologic characteristics and their geographic location. As radiologists, recognizing lung disorders also often requires us to simultaneously consider morphology and geography. We've covered the morphologic patterns of different lung disorders in past talks. In this talk, we'll focus on their geographic patterns. In order to understand, and more importantly, easily remember why the geographic patterns of different lung disorders are the way they are, we need to understand how the physiology of the lung varies depending on where we're in the lung geographically. When talking about lung physiology, I like to use a family home as an analogy. A family home remains functional thanks to three main systems. Electricity, HVAC, that's heating, ventilation, air conditioning, and plumbing. If the family home were a lung, the HVAC system would be the airways. The plumbing system would be the lymphatics and the electrical system would be the arteries and veins. In order to understand and remember what the geographic distribution of different lung diseases are, we need to understand how well these three systems work in different regions of the lung. Let me say that again, how effectively these three systems work in different regions of the lung. Implicit in this statement is that ventilation lymphatic flow, and blood perfusion are not uniform throughout the lung, just like, for example, climate in the United States. Although the landmass itself appears pretty uniform from one region to another on a satellite map, more or less, the climate is certainly not uniform due to the effect of latitude, distance from the equator, in addition to proximity to nearby bodies of water. The lungs also appear pretty uniform from one region to another. However, the climate when it comes to ventilation, lymphatic flow, and blood perfusion is not uniform due to the effect of gravity, in addition to ribcage and diaphragm motion during each respiratory cycle. The direct effects of gravity are well known in two common pulmonary disorders. Gravity is the direct reason why free-flowing pleural effusions accumulate inferiorly in upright patients and posteriorly in supine patients. Gravity is the direct reason why aspiration generally occurs inferiorly in upright patients and postural inferiorly or posteriorly in recumbent patients. Gravity, in addition to ribcage and diaphragm motion during each respiratory cycle influence how well each of the three major systems that support the lungs work in different regions of the lungs. Gravity has a substantial effect on the distribution of blood perfusion in the lungs. The lower lungs see up to 18 times more blood perfusion than the upper lungs. Lymphatic flow is predominantly driven by a combination of pulmonary arterial pressure, diaphragm motion, and ribcage motion. Due to the effect of gravity, pulmonary arterial pressure is greater in the lower lungs, which is also where the diaphragm is. As a result, lymphatic flow is greater in the lower lungs than in the upper lungs. Because of the way our upper ribs elevate during inspiration, the anterior rib cage moves more than the posterior rib cage, resulting in greater lymphatic flow near the anterior margins of the lungs. If we combine these two lymphatic flow gradients into one, we can better understand why lymphatic flow in the lower lungs and anterior lungs is greater than in the upper lungs and posterior lungs. Finally, Lymphatic flow is particularly effective along the margins of the lungs, where perivenous lymphatic channels can drain lung parenchyma directly into the adjacent pleural space.
Ventilation is primarily driven by the motion of the diaphragm and to a lesser extent the motion of the rib cage. Since the lower lungs are near the diaphragm, the lower lungs see around three times more ventilation than the upper lungs. If that sounds weird, just think about whether respiratory motion blur tends to be worse in the upper lungs or lower lungs the next time you read the chest CT of an ICU patient or approach a lung nodule biopsy. For lung disorders whose pathophysiology involves any of these three systems, which is pretty much most of them, the non-uniformity in blood perfusion, lymphatic flow, and ventilation will often influence their geographic pattern in the lungs. Smoking-related lung diseases such as respiratory bronchiolitis or pulmonary Langerhans cell histiocytosis are disorders that are driven by exposure to particulates in cigarette smoke introduced into the lungs via the airways. Since ventilation is poorer in the upper lungs, the dwell times for inhaled particulates that do make it into the upper lungs will be substantially longer, resulting in higher exposures. As a result, respiratory bronchiolitis and pulmonary Langerhans cell histiocytosis are usually more pronounced in the upper lungs, such as in this example of pulmonary Langerhans cell histiocytosis, where the nodular and cystic features of PLCH are much more pronounced in the upper lungs. Poorer ventilation and longer dwell times are also why carcinogens in cigarette smoke cause more cancers in the upper lungs than the lower lungs. When we encounter a nonspecific lung nodule, a nodule in an upper lobe is associated with a higher risk for malignancy, all other factors being equal, than a nodule in a lower lobe. That's why a special caveat exists for upper lobe lung nodules in the Fleischmann Society guidelines for the management of incidental lung nodules, and why most lung nodule risk models use upper lobe location as a risk factor. Hypersensitivity pneumonitis is another disorder driven by exposure to particulates introduced into the lungs via the airways. Poorer ventilation and longer dwell times for inhaled particulates are the reason why hypersensitivity pneumonitis is usually more pronounced in the upper lungs, such as in this patient with fibrotic HP. Lung metastases, however, do not spread to the lungs via inhalation, but usually via the bloodstream. Since the lower lungs see up to 18 times more perfusion than the upper lungs, lung metastases occur much more frequently in the lower lungs, such as in this patient. Pulmonary emboli are another entity that usually travel to the lungs via the bloodstream, and the substantial gradient in blood perfusion is why pulmonary emboli also occur much more frequently in the lower lungs. In cardiogenic pulmonary edema, water accumulates in the lungs once the rate at which the lungs can clear water is overwhelmed by the rate at which it enters. Although much of this clearance is accomplished by the pulmonary veins, pulmonary venous drainage itself does not substantially contribute to any geographic gradients in pulmonary edema distribution. While it's true that pulmonary venous drainage is greater in the lower lungs, so is pulmonary arterial inflow. What ultimately contributes to non-uniformity in the distribution of pulmonary edema in the lungs is the other means by which lungs clear water, the lymphatic system. The lymphatic system clears excess water more efficiently from the lower lungs, the anterior lungs, and the peripheral lungs, which means pulmonary edema will be worst where lymphatic drainage is poorest in the central upper through mid lungs. As you can see in this patient with severe cardiogenic pulmonary edema, the non-uniformity in how the lymphatic system drains the lungs also may influence the geographic distribution of post-primary tuberculosis. It's believed that in post-primary TB, 
the mycobacteria flourish best in areas of a lung that put up the least immune response. Since many immunologic cells travel to the lung via the lymphatic system, many folks believe that the poor lymphatic flow in the upper lungs is why post-primary TB findings are usually most floored there, such as in this TB patient. In patients with pneumoconiosis, geographic patterns of lung involvement are influenced by both the rate at which inorganic particles are deposited in the lung via ventilation and the rate at which these inorganic particles are cleared by the lymphatic system. Some particles, like asbestos fibers, are not particularly motile due to their long needle-like shape. Whenever an asbestos fiber enters a channel, whether that's a tiny airway or a tiny lymphatic channel, there's a decent chance it might get stuck at any point because of its shape. If we're talking about a lymphatic channel, the flow rate of lymphatic fluid, slow or fast, is probably not going to clear the asbestos particle once it's mechanically caught. Any geographic gradients in asbestosis are therefore primarily dictated by differences in ventilation. Since ventilation is three times higher in the lower lungs, many more asbestos fibers will be introduced into the lower lungs than the upper lungs, where many will get lodged. But why is asbestosis also a peripheral lung disorder? Well, this does have to do with the lymphatic system. Lymphatic channels tend to be small in caliber in the lung periphery. If any asbestos fibers do reach the lymphatic system after they've been inhaled, they're more likely to get stuck here than in larger lymphatic channels more centrally. And that's why asbestosis usually occurs in a peripheral lower lung distribution. In pneumoconiosis due to motile particulates like silica or coal, the location where particulates will be collected in the lung will be predominantly influenced by where lymphatic clearance rates are the slowest. For these types of pneumoconioses, the most pronounced regions of involvement will therefore be the upper lungs, such as in this patient. Armed with a basic understanding of pathophysiology and where the three major utility systems of the lung work best, you'll now have a much better shot at remembering or making educated guesses about the geographic distributions of many lung diseases you'll encounter.